Um, with that, I'm going to introduce Sylvia de Hoyos, who is part of the participatory budgeting committee at Palo Alto College. And she'll just let you know everything you need to know in terms of the event. After uh, she does a slide presentation, after we'll have a little mock run, you'll get to move out and break out in groups, and we'll direct you for that. At the end of that, there's the opportunity to engage with some city council members who will be uh, showing up, or we'll be sending people in their proxy so that they can learn also about this process if they haven't already been in the audience. And that will give you the opportunity to directly connect with people that are going to be integral to making this process work. Thank you so much. So good evening, everybody. Uh, as uh, Ian mentioned, we are from Palo Alto College, and I will be introducing shortly the rest of the uh, participatory budgeting committee uh, from Palo Alto College. Uh, initially, the whole concept of participatory budgeting came to our president. He was from Palo Alto College, Dr. Michael Flores. And as much as he would have liked to have been here, he had a commitment, and he would have liked to have been here. Nonetheless, it was his enthusiasm and his desire for us to uh, work with this particular concept, this approach, this process, that now we have embraced it and is working for us in the higher education setting. So what we will be doing is that we will actually be showing you a very brief uh, PowerPoint, uh, a little bit about uh, our experience at Battle College with participatory budgeting, and explain what participatory budgeting is in the community. Uh, I'm going to introduce the rest of the committee and let them come and we'll move to the, the department as well. Anthony Perez? Uh, come on. Everybody. We really are not that shy, seriously. Uh, so, Anthony Perez, Veronica Rosa Stadium, Susan Molina, Alexis, uh, Carmen. We actually, I, and I, I talked to you about the participatory budget <coughs> because this is a process that has come together with all of us. We as a committee have put together what works for Bible Alpha College, and we as a committee review what are the proposals that you will be looking at in terms of what succeeds. Um, and can you talk a little bit about Dr. Boyce and his assignment contribution? Sure, so uh, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, so several years ago, Dr. Flores um, approached some of the faculty and staff leaders at Palo Alto College. And it started off with an email like, hey, here's particip participatory budgeting, check into it. And so I got an email and I'm like, budgeting, why do I want to worry about budgeting? And that doesn't sound very exciting. And so once we started doing some of the research, uh, it was our faculty senate who was part of the mall. At the time, I was uh, staff council president, so I was invited to be part of the committee. Um, Carmen was our uh, director of student engagement at the time, so she had definitely a different voice. So there was a lot of different perspectives brought together to go over what participatory budgeting is. So once we did some of the research, and you know, Dr. Splittis uh, said, hey, do some research on this, look up, see if you're interested. We decided, you know, this is something that we need to explore. Uh, participatory budgeting sounds scary because that word budgeting is thrown in there. Uh, but once we did some of the research, we decided, you know what, let's go ahead and there was a conference and let's go check this out. Let's see, let's see what it's about. Um, see if we can kind of remove ourselves from the fear of budgeting. So we all went to a conference in Chicago to, to learn about what participatory budgeting is. And so that's how it really got started. There was a small group of us, again, faculty and staff leaders, um, to really decide how can this work for us at a college. So what we're going to share with you today is a lot of what we learned at that conference and how we were able to bring that back, adapt it to the special needs of, uh, of our community and make it a uh, community of college to make it um, what it is today, the, the program that we have that started off with faculty and staff proposals and now we've expanded um, to allow our students to submit proposals. So that's a little bit about what we're going to share with you this, this evening.
It just depends on how those are allocated. And that's not, and that's not here for us to say, that's just the way the process works. We then, if you notice, it started in Chicago, New York, and it's been around for quite a while. We then decided to carry it over and embrace it and use it in higher education. So this is what we did for us. Yeah, this is a lot easier. So, the whole idea of it was, well, why did we decide to do it? Why didn't we want to do participatory budgeting? Again, realizing that this is in higher education. So if you notice, this is what we did for us. It increases the higher, uh, and deepens the buy-in from all stakeholders. In our case, it's the faculty, the staff, and the students. Otherwise, it's the community, the community organizations. It provides accountability, it expands relationships between the stakeholders, and any advocates for any diverse groups, whatever happens to be. And which one, what I would like for you to do is to put it into perspective as to how you would be applying it in, in the community of city of San Antonio. Outcomes, well certainly it increases the stakeholder support, it provides a practice of openness and accountability, which is something that is extremely important to all of us, whether it's in higher education or in the community involvement. Uh, it yields collaboration and innovation among the stakeholders, and it, it builds a sense of community among the stakeholders. So what we did, uh, the infrastructure that was needed, in our case, our president, the administration, set aside the $25,000 each year for the projects. The wedding projects are then funded a maximum of $5,000 each. So I'm going to go through this very quickly because then we're going to actually experience this process. At Bonawatha, the participatory budgeting committee is the administrator, uh, one of the vice presidents at Bonawatha College, staff members, faculty members, and public relations. So the individuals that I introduced to you early on are that committee, and of course we have our public relations staff. On the other side, we have consultants. These are the experts that when a proposal is prepared, they will look at the proposal in terms of feasibility. So depending on what the proposal is that we're submitting, it could be perhaps, well, is it technology? Well, then we'll look at the IT individual and he will look at it and say, okay, it's feasible. If not, perhaps the facilities, we're looking at some modifications to the campus or other, other issues. So here's, uh, in a nutshell, as you saw the video, brainstorm, plan, vote, fund, and act. And it does work in a cycle. So as we go through it, you're going to see how that goes. So the brainstorming, the brainstorming begins uh, with a group of individuals getting together. We actually set up the time frame and say, okay, what is important to us in our community? Could it be recreation? Could it be health? Could it be education? Whatever happens to be, and it could be what is important in your particular area of town, may not necessarily be in another area of town. It's just what is important at that time. So the questions are, how does this align, in our case, with a college's strategic plan? Who will this project benefit? Is it sustainable? And um, it, it will not be allocated for personnel or those recurring funds. Uh, the idea of, is it sustainable? If it's, uh, if it's not sustainable, it's just a one-time project, well, maybe that's not necessarily something that's going to benefit either the college or the community. So then we go into the development of the plan. Develop a proposal based on whatever was put together under the brainstorming. So then we have actually set up a timetable. Month one, identify the project leads. We, the committee, review these pre proposals in order to make sure that the criteria has been met. That's what the job of the committee. Uh, the following month, then the project leads, those are the individuals that actually put together the proposal, came up with a concept, uh, and meet with the consultants. Is this a viable idea? The final month, month three, is that they submit the proposal due to the committee, and then we go into the voting. This is so much fun and so exciting because there's actually campaigning within the community. Now, we're, we're not talking about political campaigning. This is, hey, this is a project that we are involved in. This is what we would like you to vote for. So you can imagine that in a college campus where we have the students or the faculty who are all excited about, yes, fund this, this is what we're looking for. So we go into the voting. And this is what it looks like. Voting for the projects. 
The projects actually are put on display, and this is where our public relations staff comes through. They will actually, she will actually, they, or several individuals, will put together a little poster of this is the idea, this is the concept, this is what it's going to look like. A little uh, a graphic of some sort. Uh, the voting will take place over two days. Uh, all the voters can select up to three projects, depending on how many are submitted. In our case, the first round that we went through was only for faculty and staff. We are now into, Suzelle, we're into our fourth, but we actually have gone through seven, seven cycles. And we, the reason we say seven cycles and it is the fourth round is because we started with faculty and staff, then we brought in the students for their round, then we came back with faculty and staff, then we did another one with, with students. And the idea is to have everyone to have an opportunity to, to submit proposals and to then vote on their individual proposals. Um, okay. <coughs> funding. So now we're talking about the last one. It talks about the funding. Go ahead. Voting for the projects takes place before the beginning of the next fiscal year. And this is really very important. Whatever the fiscal year happens to be, the money gets put aside and it is allocated for that particular project, and then they go into actually implementing it. So the projects are funded at the start of the fiscal year. Our fiscal year begins September 1. The project leads will work with a campus budget officer. That's when the funding occurs to begin purchasing the project leads. Okay. Now the reason this, let me say this, it may take a while, uh, and I'll, we will briefly talk about the projects that we actually got implemented, explain to you what was so exciting about the projects that we, we submitted. So it is actually implementing the idea. In implementing the project, okay, now they have 10 months from September to July, which is that whole fiscal year, to implement all the projects within the timeline and the budget. The leads are gonna work with a consultant, so those are the consultants that I mentioned to you, uh, those are the experts. And then upon implementation, there's an actual review of that final project. Did it work out? Was it beneficial? Is there something that we should have done differently? Okay. Since uh, uh, I mentioned we've gone to several rounds, and we started it initially as a test to see what was going to work for us. This is what happened for us. We decided to expand uh, PB to the student-initiated projects. We started with faculty and staff, and we decided to then incorporate the next round of students. And it's actually been very successful, very exciting for the students. We then implemented a survey so we could collect feedback from everyone. Is it working, did it work, and what do we want to do different? Uh, out of the college, and this is, we are extremely proud of this, in 2015, uh, the 2015 Texas Award for Performance Excellence, the TAPE Award, this is through the Quality Texas Foundation. And we were applauded for the innovation in implementing this particular participatory budgeting into our annual budgeting process. So as I'm explaining this to you, you want to kind of consider how will that work in my community? Those are the things. This is something for us that was very new and extremely exciting for us, a new concept, a new approach. You have your typical budgeting, and then we have this participatory budgeting, and that's exactly what this that implies. The annual overall personal assessment of the college environment, which is a pay survey, another one, has indicated a collaborative environment and leadership, which is the highest of four levels continuously since 2014. These are high, high recognitions for Bible of the College, and we're certainly extremely proud of those, those achievements. So these are some of the projects, and as soon as we get past that, I'll ask Alexis to come over and talk a little bit about it. Um, virtual office simulation theater, the journey to wellness uh, from project to program, and I want to talk a little bit about those two before we can get out of the picture. So. Uh, I am extremely proud, and I'll go ahead and ask uh, Veronica if she wants to add a little bit more of this. The first, the first year that we had this, they asked if we were interested in doing something. Well, I was honest, I am a business instructor. I'm a faculty and I'm all about business and doing what we can do. Well, we had our capital funds, we had everything that was uh, budgeted for us, but there was some other things that I wanted to do for my classroom, some enhancements. I wanted technology, I wanted the virtual reality, I wanted all those things. And as much as I wanted it, we didn't quite have the funds to do it. So I had a committee and I asked uh, Ms. Taylor if she would also work with me. And we actually had a committee of several of us. She's actually the chair of my program. Uh, so we got together and put together this proposal for the virtual office simulation theater. Well, it got funded. I was so excited. But that was only partial funding. So the following year, I submitted a phase two for that proposal. 
and that included then another virtual reality enhancement, the simulation theater. And that was funded again with that second proposal. So this is something that for you to consider as you're looking at the community. And I'm going to ask Alexa for briefly, you can go into the journey of the For a journey to wellness, um, ours was that we, had, as we're in the kinesiology department, kinesiology and health, and we were constantly getting people and faculty and staff asking, hey, can you develop a fitness plan for me? Or can you do um, training? Can you, you know, tell me what my body composition is? <coughs> and, but we didn't really have a set, you know, they would just have to come up to us. So our first time out, um, as part of the journey to wellness, we put together a plan where we would take applications, take those people, and take them through a fitness training plan. Um, it was very popular. So popular that when we go back to the, that's why I kept hitting on that you can't hire anyone. Because it was just faculty doing it kind of on our own time as a volunteer. And for that reason, we could only have so many people. Well, it became really popular, and then it became popular among other faculty and staff that were like, well, it's not in my, you know, I have a degree in kinesiology, even though I'm in computers. So we kind of opened it up the next year to more people because we had more faculty and staff. So not only was it that we had more participants applying for it, we actually had more people being able to be almost coaches, to say, and to help us through. That time, we not only took them through an entire workout project, the ending was a 5K race where they were able to, we paid the entry fee, and they ran the 5K and or walked it. We had people that were coming up that said, you know, I, didn't, I couldn't walk a mile. And one of the biggest things about this was that all of a sudden, now they were walking around campus. So it wasn't just that they were doing it off time, it was that we were bringing it back onto campus, and people were starting to get out of their office and walk to the other buildings versus just emailing somebody or calling them. And so when you talk about the stakeholder buy-in, that's one of the big things. Just because your project is for one thing. Ours was for fitness and wellness. It was literally to take them to a plan and to take them to an event. From that point, it grew. And we, were, we got to the point that we were, I applied the <coughs> first year, and then the second year, and the third year, and each three times, I got funded. To the point that the fourth year, they were like, don't apply, here's your money. So it went from being something that we were asking for and they saw that it grew. We went from the first time only doing 15 people. This past, um, we did the Fiesta 5K, 10K, and we had 42 people registered, which meant they had gone through all of our projects and they had either done a 5K or a 10K. Because it had become so popular, it went from being part of the participatory budgeting into part of the budget. So now I've applied, so other people can apply. And other people are saying that, okay, fitness and wellness is important because, I don't know if you saw on the slides, one of the ones for this time is exercise bike desks for students so that while they're studying, they can cycle. And so no longer this part is set. Um, and one of the examples through the participatory budgeting is the same thing happened in New York on a much larger scale. They found that schools kept winning. And what that brought to the attention of their, they're not called councilmen, but councilmen, was that, oh, people want more money for schools. And so all of a sudden, instead of being part of that discretionary fund, part of the regular city budget, more of the regular city budget started going for the education. So it's one of those things that through participatory budgeting, the wants start coming out. And if more and more people are wanting and that same idea, that same need is there, it can bring the attention of it and bring it out into the regular budget. Um, and so that's one of our, the journey to wellness and how we can Yeah, as, as Alexis mentioned, one of the, the beauty of this is that this is um, actually just focused on the project. It's community organization or community initiated. 
This is not something that is brought up as a result of a council member, or an alderman, or a public official, but rather these are these are ideas, these are issues, these are concerns that are brought up by the community. I think that's the beauty of it. That's what makes it so good and so successful. Um, go ahead to the next one. And we're done. Okay, so uh, did anybody else want to offer anything else? Veronica, uh, Anthony? is it's not about um, our administration. It wasn't about um, the uh, district administration. It was about the students and the faculty and staff. And as a community, what we're learning is um, as we grow out just toward budgeting, is that it's, it's not a political uh, event. It's not about um, individuals that are running for office. It's about us. It's about empowering people, you, and making you have an opportunity to have a voice. And that's what's so incredible about this, is that we found, um, we went to New York and Boston and Chicago and California and all these places around the United States, people were self telling us, you know you're the only one doing this in a higher education setting. Yeah, we know that. But our president had this vision that it wasn't about him. It was about turning this all around and making it about the faculty and the staff and the students. So how amazing is that? That's what we want as a community. And that's why we're here today, because we feel that this is going to give us, we're going to flip the pancake, you know, and this is going to give us an opportunity as citizens in this community to change the way we do things. We, if this rolls out, this would be the largest city, not only in the United States, but in the world that is pulling out participatory budgeting would be the largest and um, that is something that, that, that says something about our community and I, I just want you to know that we're the loudest cheerleaders here because we saw what this did to our small community our college community and it really changed things people that didn't communicate did people that um, had biases and maybe had judgmental views didn't so it's a great opportunity so I, I encourage you to think about flipping the pancake and getting involved in which is important by you. Yeah, thank you, Suzelle. Uh, yeah, in a nutshell, perhaps not in a nutshell, that's exactly what this is all about. And if you see the excitement in our part, that's because we saw how useful and how much we were able to turn it over to those that matter, our students. And they were able to say, we have a voice. And if you saw that video, you paid attention to the video, that's what the individuals were saying. There were the various community organizations saying, I had an opportunity to make an impact. It was me. I, they listened to me. I had a voice. So now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to... Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do you want to see if there's questions or we can answer questions in the group? Or when Yeah, if you have any questions, what we're going to do next is we're going to do uh, in an actual mock, an exercise, uh, to have you go through it. But if you have any questions before this, uh, in terms of the approach, the concept, any of that, we'll do that. And then we'll, we'll run a little scenario so you can see what it actually is like. Please feel free to ask any questions at all, and they will be ready to answer your questions. Uh, yes, ma'am? Yeah, I wanted to know um, what you could tell us about the challenges that you encountered while trying to implement, and then also, once it was implemented, any other challenges, maybe feedback you got from the community that you encountered after it was implemented. Okay. And, and, and please remember that our community is our campus. Okay? Uh, and, and please, Anthony, Veronica, uh, uh, I welcome you to come in and talk about the challenges that we had. Alexis, come on over. Because uh, this is really very uh, communal. Pardon me. Yes. Uh, Carmen is actually very, very good. She was actually at the onset talking about the challenges that we had. Uh, those are the things that first came up. It's like, oh wow, did we think of this and why did this not work? So with this, it went just like in anything. We had a lot of ups and downs. We had a lot of challenges, but every year we got better and we addressed those challenges. At the beginning, the way we started it was we would have people the first semester which was August through May, we had um, them, uh, whoever, we would have workshops and we would show them how to do the, the project and how to come up with the project. 
And, but the thing is, our big issue was, what we didn't know was an issue, was then we only gave them January through July to implement it. And that's when we realized it takes time to order things, it takes time for things to get done, especially if we were going to have any kind of um, monument or something that on campus, all of that takes time. So that was number one, we needed to expand it. So what we did was we, we gave them the whole year to go ahead and, um, and be able to implement that. Another issue that we had was um, as we reviewed all of these uh, proposals, we thought, oh, these are all such great ideas. However, we kind of left the administration out. We didn't have them look at these because then we found out that they already had some of these ideas in thought. And this was already going to be institutionalized, whatever some of their ideas were. And so now the next step was make sure we run all these through, all the proposals through our administration so that they can see if this is something that they've already had on their radar. Because if it is, then it's automatically going to be taken, taken funded. And, and it, but it wasn't to say, you know, no, I don't like you, I don't like that one, I don't like that one. It was to see, you know, is this something already that's on the radar? If it's not, then we put it up for, we put it up for a voting. If it is, then we let them know, congratulations, this is something that's already going to be happening and it's already going to be funded. It may be, it may be down the road, but this is something that an administration wants. Uh, another thing was um, we really needed to make sure that they had a liaison because as they were creating these proposals, they had a lot of questions. And so they would just email all, all the, everybody on the committee and the committee was like, well, are you going to answer that or who's going to answer that? So then we went ahead and selected one liaison who would be working with the faculty and staff and one liaison who would be working with the students. And if the students had any questions about from the beginning, uh, from the proposal to the implementation, that would be that one person that they would talk to. And so, and we would always also say, this is our timeline, where are you with this? And especially with the students, we needed to grasp, we needed to have that, bring, bring that in to make sure that they stayed on, on task. Because, you know, they have other things to do. They have organizations, they have a lot of other things to do. So we need to make sure that they stayed on task. Um, and then another thing was, um, we wanted to make sure that we involved the consultants a lot more because some people have a grandiose ideas but don't realize that $5,000 only buys so much. So we needed to say, okay, then this is, that's why we had the consultants, IT consultants, so they could say, okay, this is exactly how much things cost. Let's go back to reality. We know we want to, you know, change the world, but reality says we can only afford this much. However, you might be able to implement it in phases, just like Sylvia did. She implemented, she did the first phase, and then it, she wasn't automatically voted in for the next phase, but she wanted to suppose, and she went, in, went ahead and put it in, and she got voted in for the next phase. So this is not a popularity contest. We don't, it doesn't even say who um, is putting it together. All it says is, this is an idea. Because again, we didn't want the popularity. We wanted, we wanted everybody, we wanted to be very transparent. We wanted everybody to support whatever it is that, well, that we were proposing. So those were some of the challenges that we had. And every year, we got some, you know, something else that we hadn't thought about, and so then we would add that in. And so this is a work in progress. It has been for the last, what, five years? And so we're hoping that we will be able to overcome, we have been able to overcome some of these uh, challenges. And then anything new, we, we take that into consideration. We don't see that as a failure. We see that as e evolving. Yes, ma'am. Um, I guess my number one question is, how is this going to translate to a citywide plan? Are you guys, this is like, you guys are trying it out here, brainstorming it here at Palo Alto. How is this going to translate to the regular community on sides of the city that sure. need infrastructure, et cetera? So the way that they did it in Vallejo, the way they did it in New York, was they have, um, their assemblymen have discretionary funds. And they said, we are going to set aside this amount of discretionary funds, $100 million, yeah, we, we wish. But like, uh, let's say, uh, so some of them actually did a million dollars. And they said, now this is what um, we're going to do on the side and let the committees decide. And that's something that we're trying to approach the councilmen that we have here. What, every, every city obviously has a different kind of 
budgeting structure, but we wanted to see what can we do to have that discretionary, like if it's called discretionary funds or whatever it's called here in San Antonio, we want to see how much they are willing to kind of pledge so that um, then we can let the communities know. Um, I, I know from Ron Nurmer, I know he had mentioned that he had done a, some, something similar on a smaller scale um, just to kind of try it out in his district, which, which was District 8. And so he wanted to kind of bring, bring that in. And so this is something that we are trying to visit with each of the city councilmen just to kind of, kind of show them basically what uh, it has, uh, the impact it has had on our school and how it may, again, that transparency, because we know transparency and budgeting is <coughs> very fuzzy numbers. We want to make sure that people know where the money and their taxes are going and have maybe a voice for that. Yes, sir. Al Townsend, I'm the president of the Paul Pikes Neighborhood Association. <coughs> we were ready to go with a community project about three years ago, and we thought we had, had the buy-in of our councilwoman. It turned out once, once that my wife and I, Diane Lang and I, went to um, Vallejo to a conference on community, on the participatory budget. Came back and it didn't, it turned out she wasn't really willing to do it. She got cold feet or she said, I can't, I can't do this. And I think with, with council people, there's the feeling of losing control, which of course they will. Uh, I think that this is a wonderful de democratic approach. Uh, Palo Alto is a, like a very enclosed environment. I applaud, applaud you guys for doing it. But there is, is, I want to let everybody know in this room that it is possible. It's going on all over the country, all over the world, actually. And it is possible to implement it in a city. Um, what we had hoped to do was take the, the uh, uh, discretionary funding, at least $100,000 of it, and then work the process out by getting citizens to be not just the people that vote, but the people who make the rules about how voting is going to be done, who attend meetings, then go back, who talk with the city uh, get staff to find out how much things really do cost, in fact, and but ultimately who take responsibility for it. And so that's, I think that's what this lady is asking, is how, how are you going to translate this college experience into the big bad world of San Antonio? And at least I know how I would do it if I got the chance. Thank you. Uh, just a real quick response to that. Uh, that is why this has been brought. This is not a Palo Alto College initiative. They asked us to, they invited us to show you how it works, as you mentioned, in a closed environment. And it did work very well for us, and it does continue to work for us. And granted, yes, it is a matter of control. It's a perception of control is being relinquished. All of that is part of the, the engagement, the discussion, having those talking points. It is not up to Palo Alto College or any other to actually go and approach and say, you will do this because it's working for us. That is where the community comes in. What is happening right now, hopefully, is the doors being opened, uh, perhaps coming to the table to have those discussions to say, this is how well it's worked. It's worked in Boston, it's worked in Chicago, it's worked in these cities, and it's working in Palo Alto College. And as, as, as Suzelle mentioned, uh, this, is a, this is an opportunity. Will we be taken? I can't say, can't say, but certainly it's an opportunity. Oh, you mentioned, I'm sorry, you mentioned somebody that you were invited to do this presentation by the city of San Antonio? No, this was not the, the city of San Antonio. No, this was a San Antonio Progressive Alliance, which is why Elaine was the one to mention. So it is not meant to be partisan in any way at all, just to show what happened with us. Uh, again, like I said, that's really more from the San Antonio Progressive Alliance and what their communication has been with the various council persons or any of those either running for office or in office. Uh, as, as far as our role, it was really more to demonstrate this is how it works. So I really can't speak to who, who, who is involved or who is interested or not because that information was not provided to us.
Okay, so what are you thinking of? <laughs> you know, that's interesting. Chicken or egg type of question. Uh, in our case, it was administration. And he, he brought the idea to us uh, with the community. It does begin with the community. Uh, if you notice in the video, Josh, Josh Lerner, he is the president of Participatory Religion. He came up with this concept. Um, so he and his community approached their alderman in Chicago. So it was the community and said, you know what? We've been waiting to get these things budgeted, and it's just not happening. Well, they approached their particular alderman. So in that case, that's the way it occurred. Did it happen that way in New York? I don't know. How about I hope perhaps? But it, 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 it's kind of a chip and or egg type of thing. Perhaps it's a community thing. Uh, if one of the council members is already kind of toying with the idea and maybe has something similar to it, but not quite participatory budget, so the community, I'm going to say, you know, Mr. Council Member, Mayor, this is this is what we're thinking, and now we're we we have picked a momentum. These are the things that we're wanting to approach. Sorry, I was up in the tech space. My name is Elaine, and somebody asked a question about uh, City Council. The second to last question. Um, I just wanted to say I'm representing Brick. I'm a social worker, community social worker on staff at Brick, and I host a civic engagement series on Tuesdays, and this is. One of those. This is our kickoff for participatory budgeting. We're going to continue the discussion each second Tuesday of the month. So the next one will be on July 11th, Tuesday, same time as we develop this and as it grows in the community. It is an organic and dynamic community led process. We have invited a number of city council folks and candidates and mayoral candidates out um, to participate, and they'll be arriving probably about 8 o'clock. We told them towards the end. Eight, and they'll be hopefully coming in and they want to say that they support this kind of initiative. This is their opportunity. It's not part of necessarily a campaigning stop. It's just this topic, participatory budgeting. How would you like to be a part of it implemented? Do you agree with the ideas? Um, San Antonio Progressive Alliance is one of the many groups that meet in our space, that we allow into our space so that we can foster our community better. Um, and they actually, members of their group, reached out and knew participatory budgeting, and so that's the connection in terms of San Antonio Progressive Alliance. But this itself stands alone, like she said before, it's nonpartisan, and it does involve everybody who would like to participate. Uh, for her? For, okay. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I can tell you why none of the city council people are here, and today's the last day of early voting, so everybody's <laughs> working in the polls, and I, I'm sure they'll be oh, sure, sure. yes. so. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the candidates for city council I mean, in the runoff. And last year, we took the mayor and five city council members to Spain. And we had a very long, full day meeting with the mayor of Spain and their participatory budgeting team. Uh, it's okay. the, uh, Spain has 100 million, dollar, 100 million euros set aside. I'm sorry, Madrid has 100 million euros set aside every year out of its budget to participatory budgeting, and they put it through the exact same process uh, that you guys do. Uh, obviously, they have a different website, uh, but theirs is called uh, Decide Madrid. I'd encourage you all to see it. The mayor of Madrid sat down and did a workshop with Mayor Taylor and five of your city council folks uh, on the subject of participatory budgeting, and the walk away from that was that it requires a significant amount of bravery on the part of administration, right, and which is the city council, to give up the control that you're talking about, right, which is, uh, I'm about to give 100 million euros up so that the people can decide how it is they're going to budget, right? Um, and that's a, that's a bold step that Mike Flores, your president, took in letting you guys sort of have control over a piece of his budget. And the second thing that we walked away from it is that it's only as good as the number of people who are willing to participate in the budget, right? And so, as important as your process is, the most important component to that is spreading the word that the process exists, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and so, uh, just to agree, in our case, we got our PR people, to, that was the very thing. Just by the very nature of our campaign for individual projects, that spurred the, the, the interest, the, the excitement for the projects, and then for the following year, even, even more proposals, and it's growing with, oh, my proposal perhaps can get funded. Yeah. A question for the gentleman. How well do you feel that uh, the mayor and the council people will visit and receive the idea of the council members? There's no way that they walked out of that day 
not understanding what it is. Uh, I think that anybody can walk out of there knowing that it was tremendously successful for Madrid. Uh, but again, it's entirely dependent upon the quality of the participation, right? And so it works, right, if you can actually get people to show up to the party and to participate in the surveying and brainstorming. Why? <laughs> most vulnerable in our community. And in District 8, we don't have too many of those individuals aside from the refugees, okay? So there's a heavy refugee population because they're along the I-10 corridor that falls into District 8, okay? But there's a huge um, generational poverty problem on the west side. Having events like this on the second Tuesday of every month is fabulous. I don't see any of them coming here because they have transportation problems or because they are working three jobs. How do we get them involved? They're the ones that need it the most. And how do we get the mayor to give up that control and say, okay, I'm handing control over to persons that maybe don't have college educations. But good idea. Well, I, as I say, for one, the, the other part of my brain comes out in my other form of life. It's like, okay, well then you have to go there. And so while well, yes, this is great and we can get people going, now, okay, so who are you going to go back to? Where are you going to go? Okay, so now that you're here and you can make a connection with either this space or the San Antonio. <coughs> okay, if you make a connection with San Antonio Progressive Alliance, you can make a connection with all of the college and the or the brick. Um, I'd say on that city level, bringing them in. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so we don't have to, they don't, this is once again not my space and not my meeting. You don't have to have a meeting here. They can travel. It's a really nice matter of so, just a quick question. We're, we're trying to record this and put it up on YouTube so a whole lot of other people who couldn't be here can replay it. The more you speak into the microphone, the less work she's going to have to do editing and getting it up to YouTube. Uh, 
So it's just saying, it's a matter of you saying, okay, now I want it. So you make a connection with the San Antonio groups and say, this is what we think we need. Okay, so where? Well, the public health person in me says, okay, so now you set up meetings at churches and at elementary schools. And I say elementary schools because that's usually your younger parent versus setting it up at a high school. But so then it's, okay, so now it's about getting the community involved. And like you said, and like reading, it's only as good as the people who want to come. So even if it's not your district, getting with that district person and saying, okay, where is the biggest need? The, once again, public health person in me says, okay, you go to schools, you go to churches, you go to community centers, you go under the bridges, you go wherever the people are, and you ask them what they want and what they need. And a lot of times, their short term is what they come up with, but it's a matter of taking that short term need and making it into a project that can be sustained. Because a lot of these worked at, you know, the kids didn't have books in the library. Okay, well, your short term, you have a book drive. Long term, what can you do to bring in newer books, books on different things, instead of just the old used books that people don't want anymore? So, so you, while you take care of the short need, you expand it into the larger need, and that's where you're working with the city of San Antonio and working with, there are a lot of city groups that can bring that in, um, but it's just about getting people involved, as many people involved as you can here. I like that too because it's a logistics question and I love logistics. Um, so, yes, going to the neighborhoods, having people from the neighborhoods themselves take on those roles is the best way to do it. Um, especially for people who are not able to travel, like you said, on two buses with kids. Absolutely. But the great thing about participatory budgeting is that the process is fueled exactly by that, by people taking it on in their own communities. What we have tonight, um, on your way out, hopefully you'll see that there's a, a sheet of paper that asks for your name and your info and which district you're in and if you'd like to take a leadership process, whatever that may be. And it might be just, I want to hand other names of other people I know who would be good point people. This works like a, a wheel system. It's cogs and then they get extended out and you get that momentum going. So this is a very good first meeting. This space will be dedicated every second Tuesday for this. We can do trainings as, as this grows, more specific trainings, the exact process. But it's all driven by the people in their own communities taking it on. So what's great is that it also involves me. Um, I want to see as many high schools get reached out to and we propose projects because if we start them at age 16 in this process, they're going to be voting at age 18. Um, so there's really, there's no limit and it has to be decided by um, our own needs in our own communities. Okay, so, uh, this. But secondly, since you guys went to various states, and in some cases I think you went out, uh, councilman uh, candidate went to uh, Spain. 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 Oh, um, yes. Mm -hmm. What kind of um, examples do you have of pushback from the local politicians? Because I don't see that it's going to be a weakness of, of the community. The community <coughs> really wants, wants change, and yes, you have to go where the most vulnerable are, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's as simple as it's, it's the quality of the people. No, it's it's the, the quality of the of the politicians willing to bend to people. I yeah. think so. We realize that our experience is really right away because we have in higher education. And I keep on referring back to Josh Ryder in the video. There is a lot of information that talks about that very thing. Uh, so I, you know, I hate to refer you to go to the website and check. That, that is where you can find a lot of that information on those very questions that you're making. They're saying, yes, there was an issue, and this is how we went around it, or that, uh, this is how we addressed it, or this is how they came to us. Um, so please, look at, look at the website. Uh, we are certainly available to at least direct you um, by the individuals from participatory budgeting. Uh, while they really want this to grow, and so they will have a lot of insights on, on how to engage the community, how to approach how to address the pushback on all, all of those, those things. So, so, yeah, just kind of along with that. So what we experienced at Paul Alton is 
not necessarily push back from the administration, but maybe push back from faculty and staff because they didn't believe that. What do you mean they're going to give us $25,000 to spend? And so we kind of almost have the opposite effect. It's like it's getting our faculty staff used to, yes, Dr. Florida is saying here's $25,000, tell us how we should spend it. So it really has to come from that community involvement piece. Uh, what, we, you know, what we're doing is we're presenting what we do at Palo Alto College and how it's worked for us, how it's been able to bring the faculty and staff together uh, and, and higher ed, you can see that division, right? Almost like how we have the division of the different districts. This district has this need, this district has that need. So the faculty have a specific need, the staff have a specific need, but then we're able to come together and identify needs together. And so once we got the faculty and staff, because we had to get faculty and staff buy-in, just like you would have to get community member buy-in the same way, you would have to get the, the council, the councilman, and of course the mayor um, buy-in as well. So it, 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 there's kind of like that, is this, is this going to work for all of us all the way around from, from the, the community members all the way to the, the councilman, so. Uh, but it is definitely kind of a challenge of getting everyone on board. And so, but once we kind of got through that in the first, uh, the first round, you know, the faculty and staff were somewhat doubtful, were like, oh, this is real. So that definitely has helped with the process and has helped it grow. Um, has there ever been Like, we want to totally like redo a park, put benches, you know, something as an example, right? And whoever was allocating that money was like, no way, man, you know, I think it would be way better to put the money, and they just like disregarded the voice of the people. So because these projects are developed by the people, so we work with an administrator uh, who's in charge of the overall budget of the college. So the committee, and, and so the committee including her, we're not there to decide whether we like the project, whether we think it's a good project, or this is a better project. We're there to make sure it follows the criteria. So the people who decided on the project are the faculty and staff voting. We don't even allow ourselves the opportunity to vote because we're on the committee. So we don't want to put any bias into whether we think a project is better than the other. The idea is that this funding is there and the community decides how that is going to get spent. Dr. Flores has no say in what gets and how that money gets spent once he releases it to the DB committee. It's up to the, the, the teams that come together to form those projects and to vote about. I think also in your hypothetical, which I'm not sure if it's occurred, but I wouldn't be surprised, it has an immediate backlash, especially when you're dealing with, say, two-year terms. If you have something that all the people who are, the people who are most civically engaged, that they've gone through this process, they've done it from a grassroots perspective, and then you just absolutely ignore <laughs> what they've been working on, that's a fantastic way to get voted out of office. So <laughs> that's one of the great things about this project, is that there's pressure built into it, and there's at the same time, there's satisfaction built into it. There's a much greater degree of satisfaction as a civic participant when you have this direct connection and you know the person representing you and you're having these conversations, and you're also seeing how some of these choices are being made in terms of the budget. Um, it, it just, you're, you're better informed and you're also empowered. <coughs> Yeah, it's interesting. One final thought on, on this whole thing with uh, both Elaine and, and, and um, Anthony mentioned. When we talk about uh, this pushback, uh, faculty and staff don't necessarily always get along. And so, so if you look at that in terms of community, that, that happens as well. And then there's also, we're very territorial, whether it's the business department, the kinesiology department, or whatever, it's kind of, oh no, it's my needs, whatever I want. Again, as a community, that occurs. But, as Anthony mentioned, the beauty of this it is not the, the committee that votes on these, it is, it is the community itself. And that's where getting the word out, getting that proposal and the word out and the community votes on the proposal. And that's the way we fund it. That's based on the initial guidelines for this is how the process will work, this is the funding, and this is how they will get funded. You had a question? Yes. What was the, the overall makeup of the committee, of the PD committee? Was it student staff administration or solely administration? No, that's actually, uh, it's administration. We had a one in terms of budget, if you will, uh, staff, faculty, and we had a student representative as well. So yes, it was very equally represented throughout. And, and, and it will be rotating. Mm -hmm. in, in your experience going to other cities, were there any situations where groups or special <laughs> interests um, presented projects under the guise of individual ideas? and use numbers to influence the outcome of those projects, or, or of the voting? Well, it certainly has the potential for it, because if you notice in the video, there were certain 
groups, certain uh, organizations that were presenting proposals. So it has a potential for it. Uh, and, and those are the things that as a community you want to be, be addressing, be mindful of it, and, and to ensure that it is not one particular uh, issue that is being put forward, but rather that something is represented. And that's where the voting comes in, as the proposal is being presented. Yes, sir. Uh, and as far as the, uh, the chancellor of You know, that is so good. I'm so glad you asked that. Because the Chancellor is very proud of what we've done. <coughs> and uh, while there, you, know, you talk about political and all this stuff, um, and certainly, no one is immune. No one is immune. No organizations are immune to any kind of political activity. But our Chancellor is actually quite supportive of what we've done and what we've been forward with. Very supportive of our President and our organization. Um, what's your question? I mean, of the, all the funds that are in Alamo Community Colleges, how much is that provided? Yeah, this is not Alamo Colleges. This is Palo Alto College. This is strictly Palo Alto College. While we are supported by uh, the Chancellor and saying this is a great idea for Palo Alto College, he is supportive of each of the campuses, each of the colleges, instituting participatory budgeting in their own college. Uh, it is not Alamo Colleges wide at this point. I know he has uh, encouraged the other colleges to uh, institute that, but Bottle of the College is the only one. So therefore, it is our administration of Bottle of the College to decide on uh, the actual allocation for that. Mm -hmm. Yes? To, uh, to elaborate on this question, what would you say the percentage of the budget allocated for the PB is on the Bottle of the budget? <laughs> Do you recall what was the actual percentage? <coughs> It's, it's not a very large percentage, and, and the reason it was not large is because, we, please remember that we've been growing with it. So the first time, it was just a, a, a small amount that the president said, yes, this is a great idea, let's try it, let's see how it works. And then actually, the amount has grown uh, as we move forward with each, with each round, both for faculty and staff and for students. And, and many of those projects have also been picked up by, by administration and then continued in, in the actual fund. So I have over 10 years in nonprofits and management, and I want to say thank you for that question. That's an amazing question. I do not have a, like a perfect research answer for you. Um, off the top of my head, though, obviously, when you put something in motion, um, it can fall apart if you don't have a number of different leaders, if you don't have a lot of people who know the process. And I think something that, one of the reasons why I was so glad to bring this into break and be like, yes, we can be one of the spots, one of the many spots in the city that hosts this, is that it's dependent upon people leading in their own communities and everybody can be a part of that process. There's nobody who has specialized knowledge. There's a website that has all, all the things you need to know and a team that will always be accessible if you message them. But really, there's nothing, there's no one here who can be like, well, I'm going to be the leader of PD in San Antonio. Like, that's it. That's me. I'm going to be that person. And then if I just decide, like, oh, I really just, I don't want to do that, or I just don't like Sylvia, and you know what, I'm not sending that form in, and <laughs> it's not possible. It happens in your own communities, and you can hold each other accountable, and you can do your own vote on which projects, and everybody, there's total transparency. Everybody is seeing that process at those meetings, or it doesn't happen. So I think it's in at least some of those instances, I don't know about all of them, that they probably just ran into a lack of mobilizing that initial, you know, the, the small inner part of that wheel, the hub of the wheel, and getting that moving in a sense of having people who can fall into step, who understand the process, who can carry it on. Carry it on. This is our first meeting. Um, this is going to be a long process. That's why we're, we're trying to make sure that you all go out, and if you know places you can have meetings, and if you need help in any way, you can reach out um, through sanantoniopd at gmail.com. Um, you can reach out to the website. We have a website up and find out any information you need to do this meeting in your own neighborhood. Um, the important part is to, to be educated, and if you're interested in this process, to, to just get moving on it. Um, and that's, that's really it. That's really what makes for success. She might have. funds and how, and then second part is how willing 
our councilmen in each of our districts willing to participate in PD? That's a good <laughs> question. How do you guys like converse with that? That's a very good question. <laughs> and, and once again, while I, I hate to say I don't know, because our frame of reference is certainly a bundle of account. Um, yes, there is a potential uh, for, for the discretionary funds. In our case, our discretionary funds were the discretionary funds for uh, the President of Biological College. San Antonio, council members have discretionary funds to spend within their districts, assuming that that is what would be used. It doesn't happen that way in every city. It just depends on what the process is decided. It could be that the, the mayor or whoever decides this pot is going to be used for that. So it really just depends if it's going to be citywide. Or perhaps just a council district who say, I will use it only for mine, and I will assign these discretionary funds. So it really is, is very volatile in terms of how that will be the funding for this. But that is set up at the very onset, even before the process begins. That, that certainly is done up front. Um, Thank you. You asked about willingness on council people's hands. Um, I'm in District 5. I'm in that district you were referencing. Um, historically, um, hard to reach district, um, often purposely made to be so. Um, yes. So I reached out to Shirley Gonzalez's office, and I believe they have sent two representatives um, today to document, to get notes and learn about the process. Um, they were very, I mean, I called every number, and I left a voicemail on the phone last night, and they called me back this morning. And they said, email me, and I emailed it. And she doesn't have to be here because she's already voted in. Um, I think the reality is that if you have a number of people who are reaching out and are sending you know, flyers and press releases, and this is it, and these are the details, and you have a standing meeting and you know when they're going to be, people do show up. I mean, I see that from being in this venue, and that is obviously just my own experience. But uh, typically, if you have pressure on people, they're interested, they want to go where you say there's going to be people who want to talk to them. Have you contacted the university? Our Lady of the Lake or St. Mary's that are on the west side? That's the next step. Um, if, that's, if maybe we could talk afterwards or anybody else. Each of one of them. Yes, because uh, that's a fantastic place to start to get those leaders. And there's some folks I have talked to. I know Yvette Benavides, Our Lady of the Lake, is an excellent resource. And there's some folks in their programming over there, especially for social work, who are, who are all about this. Do you know everything else you need to know about the dissertatory budget? Are you all excited about it? <laughs> uh, thank you very, very much. We have some handouts of uh, information, just general information in terms of the process, if you want to know. Uh, as E.B. Lane mentioned, we are willing to talk your ears off about participatory budgeting. If you can generate that excitement that we have and pass it on to others and then have it in your community, whether it's in your district, your homeowners association, uh, your neighborhood, whatever all that is, that's really the way it begins. Because that's the way it came for us. And while I'm talking of experience of just about all the college, it really is not just about all the college. Because quite frankly, about all the college affects the entire South Side area. So we are impacting the students and everybody in that area. Um, Sky's the limit in terms of what proposals can be done, whatever can come up with. Uh, it really is up to the community to say, wow, I wish we had done this. I wish we could do that. And we have had all sorts of really, really interesting, uh, whether it's recreation, parks, chairs, benches, uh, swings for, for a different park area. All those developments that are not quite in the budget, yes, those, those are the ideas. So if you, if you leave with nothing else, if that inspiration and desire to, to move forward with it, will there be seven blocks? Perhaps, yes. But it certainly is worth it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would, um, we're running a little late, and this is our first event, so it, it's just important that people begin to have a solid understanding as, as and that process is going to take shape as it takes shape. And we definitely understand that. Um, would you like to have them explain the mock process or go into anything in terms of that? Because what we are going to do, which is fine, we'll just do it the next event or we'll do it, we'll do it whenever we're ready as a process of learning about it, um, was actually kind of run to what would happen in the communities. 
in libraries and schools when you actually have folks who set forth projects and vote on them. Um, they can either talk about that process a little bit more, or you can have the opportunity just to mingle and, and chat. Does anybody have preferences? I would like to hear more about the actual process. <clears throat> I just want to ask a question that the viewers came about in the way in our time, just because that was a good part of it. And that's very important. She's already in office, and I think it would be important for her to be here. So what kind of uh, thoughts do you all take it as far as, you know, her not showing up to this meeting? She's already a platform woman. I think honestly, this is our first meeting and it was a late reach out process, to be completely honest. Um, this is, a, again, this is a community run process and we are just getting started and everyone's volunteering their time. Um, so I think as we get better at running our own process, she'll know when to show up. So um, I was, I definitely felt glad that they even followed up and were like, oh yeah, we're going to try to get people here. Just because I realized I talked to them this afternoon while I was taking my shower to get ready. So <laughs> I thought that, okay, we can that's a good conversation. Uh, people are paying attention, uh, but I would definitely like to make sure that we connect afterwards. Um, any other thoughts in terms of what you prefer to learn? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it occurs to me also that we just went through a very important bond election, right? That $850 million bond package was an example of participatory budgeting. In, in some ways, right? I mean, they had thousands of hours spent on putting projects out there, letting people bring their own projects, letting council folks develop their own projects, proposing them, bubbling them up through committees and different town hall meetings, and then finally deciding upon them, and then finally putting them through, you know, the election that happened uh, last month, and so, we do participatory budgeting in, in a different kind of way, right? I mean, $850 million is nothing to sneeze at. But if San Antonio were to ever do participatory budgeting in earnest, it, it would only work with the help of folks like Paul Giovanni over here uh, and you know the Ideas through COSA and Speak Up San Antonio, which is probably the most important tool as far as citizen participation, citizen engagement that we've got. And so uh, I'd encourage you all before you leave, stop at that table ask those ladies what it is they do. And I would like to second that. Um, speak up, SA was so kind to come out too, very last minute, very last minute. This is uh, something that we've been working towards, but uh, when things come together, they all come together at once. <laughs> it seems like when you, when you launch something. And they and the city budget office have been incredibly kind in, in taking their time this evening on an early election day to come out. Today's the last day to um, put in your, your most important, most valuable things to what should be in the city's budget. Today's the very last day for them to take the notes, and they're going to put together their rough draft of the city budget. Uh, we're going to have a meeting in August, too, on another Tuesday, so look out for that, to talk about um, some of the things that went into that rough version of the budget. So they're getting lots of opportunities um, in kind of a mixed, old traditional meets new way of city meeting, um, having city meetings, and they're really trying out novel ideas. Uh, so please do give uh, your opinion, because that's why they are here. Uh, so, uh, did you raise the hand? Does everybody have a hand out? So, what, what we passed out right now is our initial intent was to actually have a mock uh, process where you would actually go through developing all these stages that I talked about, the brainstorming and putting the proposal together and, and going through through the vote and all those things. Well, in the interest of time, that's not going to happen. But if you notice in these handouts, that's what you've got. You've got the process that you go through. The beauty of participatory budgeting is that there is no idea that is not good. There is no idea that is too small. And that's what is so good about this. As these ideas, these issues, these concerns, wherever they come from, wherever in the community, they start to bubble up and perhaps, perhaps, there may be two or three groups or two or three individuals in a given uh, area of town or home ownership or association or whatever it is that now they have three different perspectives on one issue. So as they start to put that together and say, this is how we're going to address this issue, this is a proposal, and it starts to come together as one. One concept, one thought, and how are we going to put it together? So that's what these steps are that you saw. If you notice, it talks about the brainstorming, 
and then developing and the proposal and the funding and the voting and then acting from the actual implementation. And while it sounds so simple, you say, well, oh yeah, it goes through all these nice steps. It really isn't. And as you know, there's always the, the naysayers and all, all of these other things. Uh, uh, so yes, it is an issue that needs to be uh, overcome, if you will. But certainly, if, if you look at this, all of these steps, yeah, it, it is a possibility. It requires uh, engagement. It requires engagement. It requires engagement. Yeah, that's good. I thank you very much. So um, when you head outside at the bar, you'll see those forms. If you want to put your information down and how you might like to lead or what district you're in, please do so. I will probably be the one contacting you, so you'll hear my voice. <laughs> um, and we can get started on doing this same kind of meeting, or however it needs to be done, whatever meeting needs to be in your community, to start growing this. Um, it's very, um, I think people call it rhizomatic, you know, like, like plants that grow up and are connected. And then suddenly you just see everything bloom. When it happens, people are going to be a bit surprised if it was a success, just like Sylvia was talking about. Um, does anybody have any thoughts or comments or questions? Okay. Um, please. I, I could ask afterwards, um, but since this is an organizing tool, have you been in contact with COPS Metro? Uh, they are on our list. And again, it's just, it was just a time budget thing, but yes, they are. And, and in fact, if you would like to email a list to that San Antonio PD at Gmail, and we can start building out who should be on it. And then what my idea is that for each district, we're going to be having people who like know who's in which district is leading this off. And then we can even go into neighborhood associations. It really comes down to what matters to you, what matters to your neighborhood, and how, and the environment there, your own space. Um, it's San Antonio PB, like participatory budget, at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank everybody for coming out, um, for being part of this very first uh, noble experiment for San Antonio. Oh, I also did want to say, too, um, we do have some city council people, more who are trying to come. We might just miss them. If you want to hang around and kind of mill, they'll come in then, because they thought it was going to end about. 8 to 8 30 at the earliest but since we're kind of skipping that mock you know they'll probably come by you're welcome to chat with them <laughs> thanks elaine thanks for putting this on i'm with the san antonio progressive alliance and i just wanted to sell, uh, tell you a few things about what our vision was in trying to roll out participatory budgeting in san antonio um san antonio progressive alliance um, has a value system of um liberal democracy, grassroots democracy, we want everyone to kind of keep in mind that when you're making projects a vision and you're promoting them, to keep in mind that we have a lot of inequality here in town and gentrification and poverty and that this can be used as a neoliberal project also, so anything can be turned into something that it, it's not meant to be. This is meant to be a grassroots effort that brings our community basic necessities and then the projects that really kind of serve the community so that we can maintain kind of a consciousness about the future of these projects as we move along. Thank you.